Welcome back, everyone. We will be live uh, with Brian Bassett in three minutes. Welcome back, everyone. This will be our last hour of the day. And to start the session, we will have uh, Brian Bassett from Cyber Thread, one of our sponsors, um, talking about uh, building software uh, application for uh, emerging needs. Uh, Brian, thanks for being with us today. And I will shut my screen share and you can go. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks to everyone. Thanks to the, the Future Proof team. This has been an awesome event and um, glad to be part of it and so excited to see all this, uh, all this, um, the proceeds of this going to, to charity. So, so well done, everybody. I know we've got a little bit more, but um, I'm not standing in the way of the bar. Uh, Y'all can go, you know, get your drinks and, and come join me. So, so that's the good thing. And then Eric after me. So, so anyway, so we're gonna talk, a uh, short talk, lightning talk here um, about building uh, software uh, for the world's emerging needs. Um, and I've titled this talk, uh, Helping Others. So I will uh, share my screen here in a second if it's not already shared. I didn't do that. There we go. All right. So, uh, so yeah, helping others is the title of my talk. Um, so what Mr. Rogers can teach us about building software from the world's emerging needs. And, uh, and so, uh, as I said, I'm Brian Bassett from, from Simple Thread. Uh, we're a digital product agency based in Richmond, Virginia. And, um, and obviously the, uh, the, the world has changed very quickly on us. Um, and, you know, as we look at life, you know, it always presents tough decisions. Uh, but right now, I think everyone is is faced with harder decisions 
more than maybe they've they felt in in their life or in a very long time. And so this, those decisions, you know, pertain to our ourselves, um, about our family and our friends, um, about our customers, uh, and about the teams which we work with. And so uh, one of the things that I've been saying to to the to the team in which I work is that we can't think about the world um, the way it was two, three months ago, right? Down is the new up. I, I keep saying that to, to the rest of the team, um, that we need to look at the world, you know, through fresh eyes and, and empathetic eyes, obviously, because there is just, you know, so much, you know, human, human suffering um, going on. And so, so we're, we're in this space now where we're, we're fighting between, do I do what's convenient or what's traditional, um, you know, living out of, out of fear or doubt, or you know maybe taking this third path. So as as a team of um, software kind of user user experience and design folks and engineers, uh, we work with a lot of clients and we we really enjoy the work we've been doing and and it's been amazing. We've actually had quite a surge of of work over the last couple of months. Um, and and I think a lot of it is just because people are seeing um, you know that there's opportunity and, and one of the ways that there's opportunity. Um, is comes from this quote. So I was writing a, a blog post about a, I don't know, um, last month, uh, two months ago, and and uh, came across a quote by Mister Rogers. And so he has this great quote. You know, this is uh, there's another quote that's used a lot about looking for the helpers, and I'm not talking about that because that's a quote for children. The the focus for adults is real strength has to do with helping others, and so that's what we as adults, as we go about our work, our day, our family, whatever we have to think, how do we help others? And so as we go into this world, like more than ever, we have to be thinking about looking at the world, our teams, our customers, whatever, and, and helping others. So, so if you don't know who Fred Rogers is, Mr. Rogers, um, he is a uh, acclaimed uh, person who was on, who was on TV. Um, he did children's programming on PBS, which is the um, kind of public broadcasting uh, service here in the United States. Uh, for over 30 years, he taped almost 900 shows, um, and he was really fundamental in changing the way in which people uh, looked at children, talked to children, programmed um, to children. Um, and so as one of the children who he, <laughs> his programming was to, um, it, it has left an indelible mark on me, and I think it, it's left an indelible mark on many Americans who are, who are now adults. Um, you can see they did a docu. Morgan Neville, who does a show called Ugly Delicious, if you've ever seen that, he did a documentary on on Fred Rogers a couple of years ago, and Tom Hanks even recently made a movie about him. So he's having a little bit um, of a moment. Um, and so what we're going to do is we kind of take the next couple minutes here is to talk through some of his quotes and how that applies. So so the first quote here is often out of periods of losing um, the greatest striving, uh, losing come the greatest strivings um, towards a new winning streak. And so as I was going through just, you know, researching stuff over the last couple of weeks, there's this great company called Branch and they've been showing, they do work with big brands and they, I would highly recommend folks go find this research. Uh, but essentially they're checking what are users doing on mobile phones or devices or in apps? What behaviors are they, are they uh, taking and what, what has been the change? And this is just two of many examples, but you can see, you know, the big losers are travel, sports, events, you know, music, streaming, and you know, in another area, like what have some of the big winners been, you know, for shopping online, kids and pets, you know, activewear. You see more people out walking and running than you maybe have in a long time, um, and so other things are less important to us as we kind of rethink about the world and what's important to us today, this week, you know, the next couple months. So there are opportunities, and I think that's the thing that's so interesting is for all the, the hardship, like it's been so cool to see how many people have been taking inventive approaches to their business, whether it's the local coffee shop, whether it's you know, a big beer maker, um, you know, everybody's doing very interesting and, and different things. And so, so that's, that's the opportunity what we're gonna talk a little about here. So, so we have a process by which we go through, I'll put it up at the end, but the, the quotes here are helping us kind of work through how do you start from, you know, 
nothing to building something. And so, so hopefully these quotes will help us as we take that, those fresh and empathetic eyes. Um, in times of stress, um, the best thing we can do um, is to listen to our, uh, listen with our ears and hearts and be assured that our questions are just as important as the answers. And so that's important to us when we're working with companies to build things, it's not just about the right answers. It's about research, it's about finding the right questions. Um, it's about challenging one's assumptions again and again and again and doing that again and bringing more people into the conversation to get a wider, more diverse look at things. Um, so that's, that's certainly the first thing that you have to do. Um, after that, then um, you rarely have the time for everything you want to do in life. So you need to make choices. I think that is so true. And so, so we define that as, as defining, right? The idea of like, well, okay, how do we start to think about what matters? Who are the people that we're building this for? What are the stories? What are the, you know, kind of the journeys that those people are on? Um, and that will continue to kind of speed the process of, you know, learning and iteration as you, as you build these products. Um, and then, uh, you know, you start getting into a point where you, uh, you're going to start doing some things or sketching things out. You're, you know, you're starting to put together some wireframes or mockups or, you know, trying to figure out the usability of a thing. And you have to do what you have, you know, or what we can with what we have. And we have to expect that out of, out of everybody else. And so, so that's a big thing in saying, you know, don't wait until you know you've found the best solution or don't wait until you know you've sketched out, you know, the perfect solution. Like you're never going to get there. So just start with what you have um, and go from there and get the feedback and start to, to bring that into the process. Um, and then, you know, the idea, once you're kind of out of that, you know, sketching mock-ups, wireframes and all that sort of thing, you start getting into the implementation. And so it's not easy. You've got to work on that. You've got to take yourself through it. So, but you've got to keep trying and keep iterating. This is where, you know, there's iteration through this whole process, but this is where you really start to see, oh, you know, shoot, it doesn't work this way. I need to, I need to try it a different way. Um, and, you know, take the feedback and, and keep working on those sort of things. And one of the, one of the most interesting things, um, is, uh, is as you start to, you know, see that evolve, you know, that's where really the magic of what your product becomes, because you've had these preconceived notions, maybe the market's going to start to take you in a different direction than you initially uh, intended. Um, and so, you know, so then the next thing uh, after, after you're kind of implementing, uh, and I should say uh, regarding implementation, you know, as you're doing that work, um, there's a team of people that are, you know, kind of all working together. And I'll talk a little about that in a second, but you have to be open. You have to be transparent. Um, you have to show as much work as you can in that process and include the, the key stakeholders. And that's going to help you, you know, again, move more quickly. And then, you know, so, sorry. So then you get to the operation. Um, you know, when you think you're at the end, you know, oh, we built the thing. Like, nope, <laughs> you're actually at the beginning. Now users are gonna start coming into the picture and they're gonna have their own ideas of what things should be, or they're gonna find ways to break what you've built. So, you know, how do you crank this thing to 11? You've gotta deploy it early and often. You've gotta instrument everything and you've gotta to continue to relentlessly automate through this. And that in through that flexibility and doing it that way, you know, some of our clients, we have a client that works with a lot of banks um, and kind of modeling, you know, money and risk and all that sort of thing. And as this whole thing happened, they did not have a pandemic product, but they were able to essentially over the course of a, you know, two or three days, because they had built a flexible instrumented platform, uh, build a product that was ultimately going to be more valuable uh, to them and to their existing clients. And the clients were so thankful for this new risk modeling tool um, around the pandemic. And that actually brought on new customers who needed that tool and did not have that. Um, so it's amazing what opportunities, if you build things well um, in kind of in a principled fashion, um, what could come out of that. So, um, you know, this is our process. So those quotes that we just talked through, this is our process. Research, define, prototype, implement, and then operate. Um, and so, so we believe that if you go through that process and you just kind of continually work through that process, but if you can start and work through that process, that will get you 
to build the sort of product that these emerging markets need. And then the other thing is here, I have been on a lot of failed projects in my time. I worked at IBM, I worked at other big software companies, um, but this is the secret recipe as best I can tell for any great digital product. You have to have a product owner who understands the stakeholders, the needs and all that sort of thing uh, and can communicate what the market needs. You need a designer who can take a topography of what that product uh, owner wants and start to map it out and chart it for, for, the, for the team so that they can say yes, no, or this is right, or this is wrong, um, and do that quickly and cheaply. And then you need to work in concert with engineering to then, who then can start to build that thing and be checking in openly with the team and saying, hey, we're doing this, we're going this way, or you know, this, this is gonna be a challenge. Um, and that if you can keep those things growing, the, the recipe might change, you might have more of one or another at any given time, but this is the core thing, the core things you need for that product. Um, so hopefully with that, I've taken a little time. Um, if anybody has any questions, I think we might have a minute or two. So, but thank you, Future Proof. And again, thank you for the team who put this together and thanks for, for all. Thanks a lot, Brian, for your uh, presentation. It was awesome. Uh, I didn't see any question uh, coming in. Uh, but if anyone has a question, I think uh, the Slack channel will be the best so far. Uh, and if you are uh, okay to... Um, yeah, I'd happily hang out there. Yep. And yeah. I'll, if people have questions about that process or I'll make sure to post the slides in the, yep. in the Ask Brian Slack. Um, and if you want, and I'll try and post that research from, um, from Patch as well. Awesome. Thanks a lot. All right. Thank you. So... Our next and last speaker of the day will be um, Eric Boyd, um, who is uh, Apple uh, Infrastructure Architect at the UC San Diego Health. And he will uh, talk with us about uh, iOS at the hospital. Eric, thanks for being with us today. And you can share your screen if you want. Yeah, thank you. I uh, really appreciate you guys having me and uh, excited to share what we've been doing in the healthcare industry. So uh, first of all, uh, thanks for joining me at this great conference. Uh, my name uh, is Eric Boyd. I'm the Apple Infrastructure Architect at UC San Diego Health. Uh, and like many of the rest of you, I've uh, been working from home now for 68 days and have not physically been in the office uh, since. So um, what is UC San Diego? What is UC San Diego Health? How do we fit into the uh, UC system? So to kind of give you an idea of what we do and who we are, uh, the UC system is a 10 campus uh, university. We have five medical centers and 18 professional schools that form UC Health. Uh, UC San Diego is a university here in San Diego that has, uh, I want to say, about uh, six sub-campuses and then, of course, our uh, health system as a subset of that. So the UC San Diego Health Sciences includes our School of Medicine, it includes uh, our uh, hospital, and uh, then we finally focus on uh, UC San Diego Health, which is the branded patient care experience. So what I cover is the bottom two pieces of this. I cover all of our Apple devices within UC San Diego Health Sciences and uh, as part of that, all of the iOS devices in our hospital. So to help paint a picture of how big this is, uh, just the School of Medicine, is over 1,600 uh, faculty. Uh, we have 500 uh, medical students, about 80 PhD med center uh, medical uh, uh, doctorate program. And uh, we have a number of residents and clinical investigations and et cetera. The UC San Diego Health, the hospital itself has uh, over 9,000 employees that fall under that. We have over 800 licensed beds, 
and we typically have uh, 31,000 patients admitted to that uh, to those beds over the course of a year. We have nearly a million outpatient uh, uh, visits and surgeries, and our operating budget to put that into scale is nearly $2 billion. We have roughly 3,000 nurses, and we of course take care of uh, training for a lot of nursing students as well, being a uh, teaching hospital. And then we also have a number of uh, RNs that have uh, a unique specialty. We're also supporting clinical trials. So that means that uh, we have to be very responsive and flexible with how we're configuring and deploying devices for them. So I want to cover a little bit about what our hospital looks like on a day-to-day -day basis. On any given day, on average, we have nearly 600 patients in uh, our three main hospital facilities. We have typically 33,000 discharges per year. And the average length of stay uh, for a patient in the hospital is uh, 6.4 days. Some of those uh, are patients that are staying for a month. Some of those are patients that are staying for five or six hours. So uh, full window of uh, length of stay uh, that the average is about six days. And then uh, number of emergency visits as well as uh, outpatient visits, uh, which is probably close to a million. So we're seeing a lot of folks at a lot of varying states. So one of the awards that I really want to call out is our environment for innovation that uh, our team has. Uh, we're not doing anything, or at least I'm not doing anything that's more exceptional than the rest of what our staff is doing on a day-to-day -day basis. And I believe that this award speaks to our commitment for innovation. So uh, how many devices do uh, I manage? I have about uh, 2,200 Macs, uh, 2,200 iPads, which has gone up a little bit uh, over the past few months. Uh, we have 700 iPhones and 275 Apple TVs, and yes, 125 iPods. Now, that may seem like a reasonable number of devices, but when we compare it to the uh, number of Windows devices that we're also supporting, um, not, none of the Apple devices all totaled up compared to the number of Windows kiosks that we have. And of course, then uh, double that number and we have the number of PCs that we're supporting. And of course, you know, we also are supporting various conference rooms and training, uh, training rooms as well. Um, so to give you an idea of what our Lo uh, La Jolla campus looked like uh, back in 2008, uh, this is uh, one of our hospitals. And four years later, we added on our uh, Scopizio facility. And uh, in 2016, we opened and uh, our, our Jacobs facility. And in 2018, we added our outpatient pavilion. So now that you kind of have an idea of uh, what our environment looks like, let's talk about what sort of uh, technology that we already had in place before, uh, uh, you know, this uh, pandemic happened. So uh, as many of you may recall, we have a uh, patient bedside program that when the patient is uh, admitted to their room, there's an iPad sitting at their bedside table at that first set up hello screen. That patient is able to provision that device on their own. They select their language, uh, pr our provisioning Wi-Fi network, and then our JAMP servers take over the rest of the setup. We also have uh, 250 Apple TVs in some of our patient rooms, and these are locked to only communicate with just that iPad in that room. As we are refurbishing other rooms in our uh, other hospitals, we're adding in and backfilling Apple TVs in those rooms. We also have uh, 250 rooms that have Crestron controllers that are also locked to that iPad that allow the patient to control the temperature of the room, the blinds, the TV, as well as the lights. And now that we've helped the patient become more comfortable with that room, they can then ex uh, access their uh, Epic MyChart app, 
And that's a digital whiteboard showing why they're there, displaying what's happening next in terms of medications, providers, showing them their test results, and a lot more information. Uh, my favorite feature of it is actually our photo staff board that shows them in real time who's taking care of them as staff badge in and out of the floor uh, that live updates. And it not only does it show them a picture of the staff, uh, it also gives them uh, what their role is and a uh, detailed bio that they can uh, read about. So they uh, have a better understanding of, you know, who's providing them with the, with the care. It's far easier than trying to read a badge, which uh, I think by nature of physics uh, are always facing the wrong direction anyway. So in addition to the Crestron and Bedside apps, uh, we also deploy uh, 40 to 60 apps additionally to the iPads, depending on what department that patient is in. These are uh, entertainment apps like Netflix, Hulu, Disney Plus, and several others. Uh, we also want the patient to be able to remain in contact with friends and family. So we're providing FaceTime and Skype, as well as social apps like Twitter and Facebook. And then the patient can feel secure about these uh, apps and being logged into them because uh, when they are discharged, then we will go ahead and wipe that iPad. And when we're dealing with uh, 40 to 80 discharges per day, this isn't possible to have a um, human actually be involved in that sanitation process. Uh, it needs to be done digitally. Uh, we just can't afford having our IT or clinical staff running around to uh, 40 to 80 rooms a day. <laughs> So uh, we need an automated method. Uh, we use a JAMPS healthcare listener to act on our HL7 feed. And that's very similar to a medical API. And what that does is uh, listens for the feed of patients coming in and leaving or being transferred in another room. And then that listens for that command, recognizes that's a room that has an iPad in it, uh, and then informs the JAMPS server to remotely wipe that device. This whole process is uh, so efficient that it's typically faster than our poor uh, uh, transportation team. Uh, our transporters can get to the room and help the patient out of the room uh, down to the lobby. So uh, just not a dig at our transporters, just really hard to win a race against an Apple push notification. Our environmental team uh, physically sanitizes the iPad, uh, same as any other equipment in the room, and then it's returned to the uh, bedside table for the next patient. So now that you know who we are and what we've done, uh, I want to take a minute to talk about uh, what we've been working on lately. So you may recall that the uh, federal government encouraged health centers to delay non-essential treatments in response to concerns about the level of physical protection or personal protection equipment, uh, number of beds and staffing at the hospitals. So this allowed us to immediately and remotely repurpose uh, 70 iPads from the various floors that were not likely to receive any new or additional patients um, during this time. So we were able to uh, immediately reconfigure those iPads to be uh, telehealth devices and uh, have them conducted for telehealth visits. Had it been necessary, we could have even pushed a lock screen message to that iPad indicating which staff member that iPad was for. However, thanks to uh, one of my teammates, Kyle, uh, that wasn't necessary as he was uh, on site to uh, make sure that uh, all those devices were removed and passed out to their new new owners, if you will. And then uh, thanks to Apple's device management in, uh, and uh, our JAMPS management and Apple's device enrollment program, we're able to remotely configure all those uh, devices. Uh, and we also were able to purchase another 130 devices and those were all uh, configured and managed uh, or ready to be managed with the right configuration before the boxes were even opened. So again, we were able to support staff working in their offices as well as staff who are working from home. At the same time, the federal government reduced the number of uh, restrictions and the hurdles essentially that uh, were necessary for telehealth visits. And so over the next three days, uh, my other teammate, Brittany, she trained over 670 providers 
And on the fourth day, she trained another 200 staff members. So to kind of put this into a historic perspective, until this, uh, until literally that week, we had been averaging about 800 telehealth visits per year. Now, I apologize, I don't have the numbers for every single day, but uh, for the days that I do have, I do know that on day one of uh, Brittany's training, we had 183 people, uh, or 183 uh, video visits that day. By day three, we were performing 614 video visits a day. So just between day one and day three, we've already surpassed the previous year's worth of video visits. By day five, we had 924 video visits. And by Monday of the following week, we were performing over uh, over nearly 1,300 video visits. So to kind of give you an idea of what that looked like, uh, Here's a graph uh, showing, you know, blue being the face-to-face -face visits and the gold being the uh, telehealth visits. You can see there was a very rapid shift. So we were able to, thanks to our existing infrastructure and our device counts and our ability to quickly add in more devices, we were able to uh, meet the needs uh, and desires of our patients who we're looking to come in for a visit previously who are now going, yep, yeah, no, I'm good, let's meet at home. Uh, so now that we've also uh, been uh, stabilizing uh, our staffing and, and bed levels, uh, you can see that we're starting to expand on some of our uh, in-person treatments. And while you can see that those numbers are starting, maybe that, that, that chart's going to flip back to more uh, in-person visits than uh, video visits, uh, I don't think the video visits are going away. So it's a huge uh, opportunity for us there. Um, so what about our inpatients? How can we use our existing devices to uh, help serve our inpatient population? Uh, to do this, we took a multi-phase approach. We know that trying to communicate with a patient while wearing, wearing a mask is already difficult. And as an example of that, it's really hard to show empathy when your face is covered. And many of our inpatient staff were much happier to meet over a telehealth visit because they could actually see their provider. Um, problem is most EMR systems or electronic medical systems, uh, medical record systems, they don't have a plan for telehealth visits for patients that were already in your hospital. You know, patients right there, why do you need to have a video visit with them? So uh, we uh, had to find a workaround for that and uh, a way to make that easy. So the, the first easy answer was to deploy Zoom to all of our uh, bedside iPads. Uh, we were able to do this and uh, we once we made the call to go that route, uh, we took us 20 minutes to deploy the Zoom app to all of our existing tablets. When we uh, had the app deployed, we quickly pushed out a communication to our staff that they could go into Zoom, create a meeting, and then call that patient with their meeting ID and then transition that phone call to a Zoom meeting. Instant solution. Now, obviously that's not a great solution because obviously there's times for uh, there to be errors in either the provider or the patient uh, handling that code and entering it in. So how do we make that better? And also since visitations are limited, how do we involve families? So phase two was to push a shortcut to that iPad that had the patient's uh, Zoom meeting already there. So when the patient got the call from the provider, they only needed to push one button. No more error. Now we also worked with Jamf over, I want to say like a three days from like Friday to Monday to build a solution. And uh, what we built was a directory that was available to the providers that showed the providers what rooms had an iPad 
what iPad was configured, and if not, they could call the patient and ask them to set up their iPad or you know help them to familiarize themselves with it to get it uh, up and running. Maybe they didn't see the need to use it, and now the idea of being able to have a video visit with their patient or with their provider through that would be the motivation that they needed. Otherwise, of course, we could bring in a tablet, but that requires a uh, staff member to be involved every single time. So uh, providers have the patient room in the EMR system, so they can see who that is. They can click the Meet Now link to start a meeting uh, that joins that patient's room. And the provider then has a link that they can then send to that patient's uh, family and friends uh, as well to uh, if they you know, need them to be part of that uh, call. And uh, the other advantage to this was if there was another provider who also wanted to talk to that patient, they could uh, join that room and be part of that consult immediately. So like our um, existing automated solution, we wanted to make sure that we had a way to fully automate this workflow. Uh, we uh, worked with Jamf to make sure that not only were we doing the digital wipes with the iPads, but we also wanted to make sure that we were actually uh, removing uh, any trace of that uh, meeting ID so that um, if a link was sent out to a family member and then the patient was discharged, we didn't want the family member to call into a room where a different patient was now meeting or uh, receiving care from us. So to give you an idea of what this looks like, uh, the provider has the ability to type in the room number or just the department number. They can then scroll in, find their room, or you know if they're a managing a a, a number of patients in that room in that department, they can just filter out their department and have all of those uh, uh, devices listed there. This is a live list so that the providers have the ability to see which iPads are configured and they aren't trying to or sitting in a meeting room waiting for a patient when that iPad isn't even configured. So that was phase two. So phase three, uh, you know, we wanted now to focus on making that uh, experience easier for uh, the patient. As I mentioned before, we're already providing uh, Zoom and uh, I'm sorry, FaceTime and Skype to the device uh, to the device allowing that patient to log in. And that's great if you have someone who is already uh, utilizing that ecosystem. But if you wanted to reach out to a family member who maybe wasn't very tech savvy or uh, maybe didn't have the client installed, now we have the ability to, uh, with Zoom, have a video visit with a family member, even if they had family member doesn't have the client installed, they can go straight through the web browser and meet with, the, meet with their family member that way. So what we pushed out to the iPad was another uh, shortcut to the tablet that gave that patient the login information that they could log into for their room or their Zoom account that was temporarily created for the duration of their stay. So the patient can copy and paste in the uh, username and password into Zoom and now they're logged in and that account is good for the, for the duration of their stay. Again, they can tap a link to start that meeting and then we can uh, also provide that patient a little form that they can type in a friend or family member's email address and uh, any additional notes that they want to say like, hey, let's meet up at 5 p.m. tonight. And then they click send and then, uh, the family member or friend gets a, a link in their email for them to be able to join the meeting. And again, that link is no longer valid after the patient is discharged as the device is wiped. So what does this look like on the patient's iPad? Uh, phase one and two, we deployed Zoom and uh, a little web clip that made it super easy for them to jump into that meeting right away. And then phase three, we deployed another shortcut to the tablet, which gave them the ability to uh, send a link to their friends and family. So uh, some final thoughts here. Um, 
one thing I like to ask everyone who we work with or uh, works with us, if you are uh, working and supporting Apple devices, please join the uh, Apple Seed for IT program and submit feedback and requests and feature enhancements and bug reports and anything else that might be useful for your environment uh, through the Apple Feedback app. Additionally, if you are developing iOS apps, please take advantage of the Manage App Config so that we can do cool things in uh, from the management of those devices, such as pre-populating and pre-configuring those devices, like our Crestron app, where we're custom configuring it to the room that it's in without the patient or a staff member needing to do anything to that device. So um, with that, I will uh, uh, leave it open for uh, Q&A and uh, see if I can help answer any questions. Thanks a lot, Eric, for this uh, talk. Uh, we have a few questions from the attendees. And uh, I would say from a friend's point of view, this looks like science fiction. We are really far away from that in the hospital. That's really impressive. Uh, one really practical question from the attendees. Um, uh, what do you use for to physically wipe remotes and pads uh, in your, in, in, when you change uh, the, um, the patient in the room? Yeah, so uh, the physical cleaning is uh, depending on what the needs of the patient were. Obviously, with uh, the COVID response, that is a, a, a lot, uh, we're being a, a lot, uh, it's a lot more than, say, someone who is coming into the hospital, um, you know, because they, uh, broke a bone or, or, or something along those lines. Um, so uh, we're typically using uh, Clorox uh, health care grade wipes, as well as uh, I want to say they're Oxifluor uh, wipes for, uh, which are, I believe, a hydrogen peroxide based solution. Uh, but we generally go off the guidance of what our uh, health care uh, uh, specialists are recommending. We're not using any sort of cases on the iPads. Uh, turns out aluminum and glass are really, really resilient to cleansers. And um, if there are any type of uh, clouding issues for as the cleansers dry naturally on the device to make sure we've killed off all the germs, uh, if there is any kind of clouding, uh, turns out an alcohol swab on the uh, visible area of the screen uh, does a remarkable job of uh, making that iPad look brand new. Awesome. Um, so you, the work you are doing is really impressive and um, someone is wondering how big is the team to support all of uh, this iOS and Apple TV infrastructure, basically? So I manage all the devices uh, from the MDM perspective. We have, uh, I would say, roughly three employees that help deal with damaged devices or broken devices on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, we have some spare iPads in case an iPad for some reason uh, is just acting up and not joining the Wi-Fi, aka our networking team was a little too restrictive with their uh, lockdown <laughs> uh, network. Uh, we do push out configuration profiles essentially to get the device onto the, onto the correct network, but every once in a while uh, something gets blacklisted. Uh, so we, we have uh, replacement tablets for that. Um, and so we we uh, were able to uh, we're able to solve those those uh, those issues with uh, with just a just a handful of uh, staff who are already there supporting other devices uh, throughout the hospital already. Awesome. And um, do you have any um, specific uh, or special Jamf APIs that uh, calls that you use daily in the scenario? Uh, well, like I said, we're, we're taking advantage of the healthcare listener, uh, which is yeah. the uh, HL7 uh, piece that takes care of uh, all of the feed from our EMR and uh, taking advantage of that to uh, push that out to the, in a, to the MDM server, which is Jamf, and then Jamf then wipes the device. So that is by far the 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 biggest uh, the biggest piece. And I, I I always love this slide because uh, it 
it scares a lot of folks to see what this looks like when your MDM server is wiping devices over and over <laughs> and over again. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that would panic a lot of folks. For us, this just means it's working. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's been uh, that's been a, a, a fun thing. And then we're also taking advantage of some uh, uh, Jamf's ability to do webhooks, so that we can then tie into uh, the creation of the uh, Zoom account and uh, populating that information back into Jamf, so that then we can populate a web clip to the to the iPad. So that way, uh, pushing out that web clip to the iPad is one touch that just is a URL redirect into Zoom yeah. with that meeting ID. So that's really huge. And, you know, uh, that was our, that was super awesome to be able to just so rapidly deploy uh, that innovation. And I think that's been talked about repeatedly throughout this conference is that we have this ability to innovate and not expect perfection. Uh, I think everybody's been very understanding from our staff to our patients. Uh, even our leadership has been very encouraging for us to like, let's, let's see what we can do as quickly as possible and then let's make it better or polish it. We'll worry about the, the polish uh, in a little bit. Um, fortunately, I think we have a lot of uh, everyone's understanding and, and uh, that's been, We've been very grateful for that. Awesome. Um, have you been able to talk with um, Zoom for uh, manage app config? We have put in that request, and I know a lot okay. of other <laughs> folks have too. Uh, yeah. And I know uh, if, for, for example, if you're a WebEx shop, I know that the uh, WebEx app also has that ability where you can deploy via managed app config uh, for WebEx uh, so that when you launch the meeting, that WebEx will default you or yeah. will log you in by default and and that um, however I, I probably I, I imagine uh, right now that every employee at zoom is uh, working in uh, sales and helping spin customers up right yeah. now uh, I don't imagine that there's anyone not in a sales role <laughs> <laughs> that, that dotted line on your on your employee agreement saying yeah. other duties <laughs> as necessary right so uh, yeah I imagine every every single person is probably involved in uh, in selling, uh, selling and getting customers spun up. Uh, it's been really amazing at how, uh, how well all of these uh, uh, communication companies have uh, stayed up to date on, yeah. uh, and you know, I, I'm blown away. Awesome, so, uh, uh, I think we are out of questions so far. So okay. except if so someone- Go ahead and leave my contact information yeah. up here. Uh, easiest way to find me is on the Mac admin Slack as uh, I'm on there as EJ Boyd. And then uh, of course my Twitter and LinkedIn are linked there as well. And then I put up my uh, V card there. So if you uh, got your photo app, uh, photo app uh, launched, you can <laughs> point it at that barcode and my contact information's there. I'm more than happy to uh, communicate and share information and uh, collaborate with you to help you uh, see if you can utilize the solution or if there is another way that we can uh, build off of the solution. So if you have some ideas uh, for how we can be doing this better, I'm more than happy to be a part of that. So once again, thank you and really grateful to have you uh, Thanks invite a lot. me to this conference. So thank you. Th Thanks a lot again for your time. So that's bring us to the end of this conference. Uh, and to finish, uh, I would like to bring, uh, to, to invite the rest of the team. So Chad, Tom, and Becky to, uh, to share this uh, ending time with me. Um, I don't know, Chad, if you turn it on the grid part. I think you may need to unshare in order for that to work. Okay, so I will share. There we go. Yeah. We are all here. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, just uh, wanted to, I guess, well, first to thank all of, all of my uh, co-organizers for, for putting up with me and uh, helping make this all a reality. Um, definitely couldn't have done it without the team here and also our, our great sponsors. Um, 
uh, definitely wouldn't be able to have raised uh, nearly as much money for Heart to Heart had it not been um, for our, our generous sponsors. Um, I'll let Johan uh, show that slide here in just a minute. But um, you know, also thanks to all the speakers and all the attendees that have come. Um, really, really appreciate uh, everybody showing up. We we kind of put this together not really knowing whether uh, whether we'd get any interest at all or whether it would just be <laughs> kind of the four of us uh, hanging out together on a Zoom call, but. Um, we've been incredibly flattered by the the response and, um, you know, I'm seeing some uh, thanks and claps and stuff coming in on the Q&A. So um, thank you all for, for being here. It, it, it wouldn't be the event that it is if it weren't for all of you here. Yeah, that's clearly purely amazing to see uh, what we have been able to do with just a small idea at the beginning and like just four people in the Zoom account. Actually, two Zoom account, but yeah, that's that's really awesome. And thank everyone for being uh, for joining us actually on this on this event. That's that's clearly f uh, something to to organize and really uh, awesome to see that we are, we got like 130 people attending it. That's that's just awesome. Uh, just as a quick also reminder, I know we've gotten a lot of questions about videos of the sessions. Um, all of them, with uh, with the exception of one, we're, we're hopeful to uh, have shared within the next few weeks. So keep an eye out for your email. We, we have your contact details from your registration and we'll be sending out some info. Um, also, we're, uh, we're hoping to make this, you know, the first of, of uh, more than one uh, type of event. We're, we're not really sure what that's going to look like, but stay tuned. Uh, we, we will be in touch. Um, but kind of the first step in the next few weeks is just to be uh, getting those videos up published and, and getting, uh, you know, speaker slides and stuff like that that have been shared. So uh, please do stay tuned. Be patient with us. We, we need a little bit of time to rest and recover from, uh, from doing all this uh, just to make sure that um, we've got everything prepared and, and edited properly. Um, but we definitely will be having that stuff go out. Um, Johan, you, you mind showing, uh, I guess, kind of, I think we had a, yes. a wrap up slide about how much money we've been able to raise and um, uh, kind of thanking our sponsors one last time. So we've, uh, go ahead. Yeah, we got so far uh, 5,368 US dollar um, uh, funded for uh, Head to Earth International. So that's clearly awesome. And of course, nothing would have been possible without uh, the help of our sponsor, uh, Group Technology, Simple Thread, Autonomy Co-op, and the new IT, and PC Medics. So and I, I can actually update. I think we uh, we just about hit uh, $5,400. We uh, got a awesome. couple extra contributions here just <laughs> the last few minutes. So uh, thanks to, to whoever that was. We're, we're super, uh, super uh, glad you did that. And if anybody has not already... Um, uh, you know, wants to donate more, I think we put a link on the website uh, directly to Heart to Heart's um, donation page. Um, but uh, yeah, Johan, uh, again, and thanks so much to our to our sponsors again. Um, really appreciate it. If, if you're in the market for, for any of the services provided by, by any of our uh, sponsors here, I, I know most of have given an opportunity to present throughout the week. So, you know, please, uh, you know, do your part to, to help, you know, support these businesses as well. We're, um, you know, we're kind of all in this together and that's that's what what this is all about yeah um i was gonna say this has been a real thrill to put on and uh you know it, it, as an organization uh, you know technolutionary doesn't do a lot of these events maybe we should because this was awesome this was so much fun i learned <laughs> so much from the last three days um you know from seeing all the stuff that's going on in the healthcare space to all the stuff that businesses are doing to make uh, remote work a reality. Uh, and, uh, you know, to be a productive reality as well. Uh, so thanks to everybody who attended. Thanks to everybody who uh, spoke. Um, this was a really great uh, experience this week. And I, I also just want to say one last thank you to, to Tom and, and Charles, the Mac Admin podcast team. Um, uh, if it had not been for your very early on uh, media support, I, I don't think we would have had nearly the, uh, the attendance that we have. So um, really appreciate you guys being uh, uh, early and, um, you know, happy to support us. Uh, you know, when we went on the podcast, I think we really had, uh, you know, nothing planned and, and really nothing uh, uh, as far as speakers or content or anything like that. So you guys uh, really, uh, you know, went on a limb for us. And I, I really, really appreciate that. Um, also, Becky, who's uh, done a tremendous amount of work uh, to, to keep our um, social media channels uh, up to date and, and, you know, share all the information uh, online about the event. 
um, it, it this would not be happening uh, for 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 your help. And and I know you've been uh, a little bit in the background here as we've been emceeing, but uh, you, you you've done so much. So thank you again. Yep. I recommend if you're going to do something like this, you want to do it with fun, smart people. So it wouldn't have <laughs> been anything as great as it was without that. So. All right. Um, I think um, with with that, uh, we'll probably go ahead and proceed into uh, another uh, happy hour here, as we have done uh, the past few days. We'll we'll have that link in Slack here momentarily. Um, but again, thanks to all who who have joined us, and and thanks so much for for taking some time out of your busy day to to be here with us. Uh, we really appreciate it. Cool. We'll see folks shortly. Right. See you there. Yep.